Hello, everybody. Um, I hope everybody saw us at the AWE playground and the big booth. <laughs> I don't think you can miss us. Um, so I'm from Sanitech. Um, basically, we're an LVVR um, specialist. Um, we, we actually own our own LVR center for the last three years in Pennsylvania, where we work with a lot of children on VR educational experiences, um, AR educational experiences. We also do birthday parties and um, individual play, multi-party play. Um, what we created there is really a um, social environment for people and families and schools to enjoy VR and AR education. Um, the reason why I'm doing this talk today is um, we've worked recently through our partners at Chicken and Waffle, have worked on um, some projects. Um, we do have one coming out, um, Finn, was a, when will that be released, next month? Yeah. At a major um, historical um, museum in the United States. Um, and the conversation here is really about the ROI and Finn might help us a little bit of why they did what they did. And also um, through the LVR space, um, we're gonna talk about on how museums and science centers could use that to um, uh, get schools and camps to come into their location. But one of the, one of the issues is that, um, especially in economical areas, people can't travel like Camden, they're not gonna go all the way to New York City. The funds aren't there, or it's just too far away. Um, I've actually been to a lot of educational um, places and you know, they always say we don't like to travel more than, you know, a school doesn't like to go more than one hour. Um, in New Jersey, they can't come to Pennsylvania. They're not allowed to go out of state. So they can't even go to Manhattan and see a museum. So what we're gonna discuss it on how science centers and museums through the LVR space could make um, really great virtual reality or mechanical reality experiences and then be able to also make a profit on that and through our network of LVRs and be able to, you know, get like a um, percentage of that. So um, there are approximately 850 million visits each year to American museums. So it's obvious people are going more than once. Um, I know when I'm on vacation, I go to Cape May, New Jersey. We've been to the Cape May Museum. Um, and museums spend more than $2 billion each year on educational activities. The typical museum devotes three quarters of its education budget to K-12 students, K-1, K you know, K-1 to 12 students. Um, in the past year, Senatec has ho hosted and taught over 150 VR and AR classes. We learned that kids, parents, and educators do enjoy VR and educate, no, VR and AR educational experiences. So um, Zach over here is my director of education and um, he's gonna talk a little bit about what they like to do, what they like to enjoy. Um, I, I have a 13 year old son and um, he's very smart, but trying to get him to go to a museum, <laughs> it's a little tough. Um, you know, he was constantly asking his mom, can we get out of here? But if you have a VR, AR experience, it just makes it more interesting to them. And um, Finn's been an expert on gamifying that where um, he's gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about the museum? Sure, sure. Um, so when we approach uh, museum content, uh, there are, you know, every museum's unique. Uh, um, every um, exhibit at the museum is typically unique, uh, but they all have a similar uh, common denominator in that there's an assortment of different things for you to come and see. And so we've, uh, we've had some success building interactive AR scavenger hunts and uh, 360 locations inside the museum, so to speak, um, where you know we can, we can set up a network of Bluetooth beacons and triangulate your signal, know where you're looking, where you're standing and where you're looking at all times. And that also allows us to know when you're getting near places, do call outs that you're nearby this thing, and then play you know, some gamification of searching for the augmented reality artifact, collecting that, and then having a review of your artifacts. And then uh, through that, you're basically uh, delivering the, the content as, as well as all the write-ups. You know, along with all the content curated from your, for a museum, there's always you know, three or four paragraphs for every artifact around the museum. But typically, you'll walk up to something with somebody, and they'll, they'll look in and be like, oh, that is really cool. And they're like, oh, what, what was it talking about? I'm thinking, they're like, I don't know. I didn't read it. You know, and because so, gen, gen, uh, generally people don't want to stand there and read. Um, some people do. I, I, I like to read at all, but I'm a nerd, you know, so like I think that uh, doesn't make me the common uh, just museum goer, especially not if you're like, you know, a young child um, focused on how cool the dinosaur looks uh, versus, you know, learning about the average weight, learning about the the size and learning about these things. So what we do is we, we also gamify, um, 
unlocking different elements and collecting different different artifacts and pieces through uh, through simple quizzes based upon content that is available from the other content you've already unlocked. So basically it becomes like a progression element and people see that as a gamified experience and it's something to engage them with the content. And then you provide those unlocked experience, uh, those unlocked artifacts as review content and you find people reading all the content three or four times, they look at it, they observe it, they've somewhat you know, tied themselves to collecting that idea. It's kind of like in Pokemon Go, um, you found people that you know have 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 Pokemon that they like now, even though they never really liked them in the card. But it's once they get that 3D element in front of them, they really feel like they've had some spatial presence with that character, and they have some relationship to it. Um, up here, we put the top XR educational experiences. So um, we collect a lot of data at Cenotech and Chicken Waffle. One of the benefits of owning our own LVR place. Um, I do get a lot of questions like, why are you guys in Pennsylvania? And we just had a local mall. And really the answer to that is it's near my house. <laughs> I mean, honestly, uh, I'm the CEO of the company and we talked to a major mall company and they're ready to roll it out in all their malls. But it, they, they said to me, pick any mall in the United States. And I said, you have a mall right near my house. So um, it was convenient. And it was actually a really dead mall. Um, and actually, you know, as, as a test site, I was like, well, we can make that successful. Um, you know, by putting a, a VR center in the middle of Manhattan, I see a lot of VR centers in California. I, I know one down in Orlando. I'm like, that's not proving the concept up. What we wanted to build was a local educational VR center that will work for local communities. And um, the mall company is really happy with the um, economics and the ROI on that. So it's the same type of ROI that a museum would get. Um, what we did learn in the last three years is that um, parents, um, we did discover moms who between the ages of 30 and 45 is our main customer. They're the ones who are making decisions. I'm a dad, and honestly, when my wife wants to go, is where we go. <laughs> you know, when we're on vacation, I'm kind of like wherever she wants to go. I don't mean, I'm not trying to make it a sex remark, but this, they seem, they're the ones who are coming to our Facebook, the data is they're coming to our Facebook page. They're the ones who are deciding what the children are doing. So in marketing <laughs> ways, in, you are marketing to a mom between the ages of 30 and 45. Um, and the kids all follow. I mean, like, I, again, I've experienced my son. My wife will listen to him. But they, the kids do love certain things. They, they love historical accurate events, what moms do. Kids love space. Um, Zach might be able to talk about that a little bit, yeah. the classes we taught. Um, they love underwater adventures. They love visit, visiting places they've heard about. Um, we did a VR class at um, Villanova University, and they were really obsessed with seeing what other colleges, um, their VR experiences. And then they said, um, can we see ours? And we're like, you guys don't have one. So we made that into a project with them saying, why don't, why don't we all make one together here, uh, a really interactive VR where you can see the college. And um, you'd be amazed how these college kids really were into just seeing other um, colleges and visiting places they'd never been to. And so, um, animals and dinosaurs. Um, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so as Bill said, we have a location-based center, but we also do travel to schools. So. As the director of education, um, I'm, you know, most uh, focused on, you know, getting students Sorry. to experience some of these, uh, you know, these things that Finn are making and, and everything that's out there. So what I've found is when we go to schools, I, I always like to start with a space experience. Um, you put, whether it's uh, K through 12, anyone you put in outer space, they immediately love it. The teacher is there. Um, the, way, the way it works, just to take a step back, I'll go in to a classroom with 30 headsets and I can run a lesson for an hour or we can do a day, it really all depends on the school. But when we get in there, I'll, I'll run a lesson and I'll, I'll start on space and immediately the kids are just looking around at all the spaces and they love it. And from there, we can really uh, you know, talk about whatever the curriculum is at the time, we always coordinate with the teacher to kind of plan something out. And we do uh, Google Maps, we do location, geography, we get into physics. <laughs> and then when they come to us, so some, uh, here's a little anecdote. We went to a third grade classroom. We did a lesson for one hour and the teacher was so impressed. She brought the whole uh, third grade, four different classrooms to our center. So we had 90 students then coming into center tech and there we were able to give them a little bit more engaging experiences as well. And, um, and that's just continuing to prove that, um, you know, if you get in there, if you get kids in front of it, show the teachers. Uh, or museum directors, then they're going to want to see you know, how can we get that even better. And and you know, m m with with the content, you know, for where we typically focus our efforts towards is uh, the user experience of the content. You know, one part is how cool is the content to consume. But if you look at most AR and VR, just XR in general, whether it's a uh, 
holographic projection, uh, you know, light field glasses, uh, you're using AR on a phone, you're in a VR headset, any of the XR, the cool factor of learning, right? It, it, it adds that extra element, but you know, you, if you've tried a lot of these experiences, they, a lot of times they feel like tech demos because they're developed by the, and, and focused by the people that uh, have the aptitude to set it up but they typically don't iterate on the user experience. And so what they're talking about, you know, what, what Zach's talking about specifically is why it's important to build um, with educational experiences. It's really important to build that, that user experience loop of um, giving the parent or the instructor control over the guided lesson. Um, because as a kid, you know, I don't know how many of you have kids or nephews, but they are experts on anything, yeah. especially technology, and they'll just take it and start doing their own thing. And so having some tools in there for a lesson plan um, guide, that's really important. Having, especially when you're dealing with like a multiplayer experience that you want to put a bunch of people in there and lead them all through, that's kind of where, you know, at Chicken Waffle, we've focused on kind of uh, sharpening the tip of the spear on how that user engagement happens, how that, uh, how that evolves as a, as a lesson plan. Because a lot of times what we find is that you'll get those things, and whether it's a museum or an interactive, uh, you know, like a tutorial uh, job training kind of experience, we've done a lot of safety training and things like this, what we'll find is we'll build what they desired, we'll get them in front of it and have some use cases, and we'll find that, oh, number six is being skipped, or number six isn't doing right. It's because, oh, that's kind of similar to number nine, and so they get the orders mixed up. And we didn't really notice it, because tangibly, when you're actually going, it's on the other side of the thing, but as an XR experience, space, you, get, you lose space. So the act of walking around the object, if that was the thing that you remembered, you know, step six versus step nine, that kind of goes away. And so there's just different, there's also different approaches that you don't really see in the real world that become apparent and maybe even hurdles in, in technology. Yeah, well, one of the things we've also discovered through a, a teaching these class is that, is that kids, especially within six months, they're not into 360 videos anymore. They really want to be interactive. They love touching things, feeling things. Um, you know, they like the haptic feedback type stuff. They really, you know, there's a lot of, I went to, um, I won't say who they were, but I went to a, a conference yesterday and they were talking about the 360 video of a major IP. And, you know, in my, in my mind, I'm like, why, why would you make it? You're introducing people to VR for the first time and you're just showing them a video. Um, and also one of the things I noticed with the education stuff is like, it's almost like the engineers who haven't made it originally, they made it like online training. The kids, kids don't play outside anymore, so parents want to see them playing with each other. They want to make it fun. They want to like, like they love, like they love to be in a room. Um, one of our first VR experiences we did two years ago, we forgot to tell them not to stand up, and we had thirty like six six-year-olds standing up at the same time going like all over the place and we were like whoa 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 you need to stay in one place now with you know like with the oculus rift um when the oculus quest um with, with, with there's no reason not to have that and you know i'm not pushing oculus but you know we, we work we work cross-platform with everybody we work with magic leap we work with um some new vendors there's no reason not to have good tracking and not to have it where it's an interactive experience and stop Stop showing 360 videos. I mean, and they're not going to pay for that. They're not, you know, if you own a museum or science center, you want them to upcharge on that. Um, we're going to talk about a museum that was having some issues, and now they're making a lot of revenue on upcharging, selling people, families, a device that, you know, um, there's good ROI on that, that they will buy because it's an interactive experience. And I think that's, you know, uh, that's a good point, too, is whenever you, um, when you're, when you're building experiences for museums or educational experiences for either job training or an education center, um, a lot of people have a, a limit of the VR they consume, they can consume, especially with 360 content because even subtle content can make some people nauseous in a, in a, in a cardboard headset with 360 video. And so one of the things that, you know, a term that I've been using all the time and I try to get all my clients on board is monoscopic VR. You know, you can hold a tablet in your hand and look around and have a cool immersive experience. It's easier to, to develop that way too and you have your fingers back into the, into the play. And so uh, 360 video, while it's not necessarily hot anymore, right? Everybody's seen it. It's, a lot of people say it's not even VR. What we've found actually some success though too is if you, you know, a lot of content can be uh, 
can be delivered in that fashion though. And it is, it can be immersive. What we found some success with is mixing AR and, and 360 video so that you place down AR markers and then those AR markers have things on them that you can unlock the three, you can go into 360 video and look around like as if it's placed you into that teleport zone. Um, and I think that can be really interesting. We did a project for Red Bull uh, last year that uh, you, they had a photogrammetry mountain with all the racers' uh, bike routes down it, and then you could choose between the racers, and a bunch of little spheres would pop up, and you could choose any of the spheres, and they were either points where you could watch the racer ride by really fast and then go slow-mo as they were doing a flip over a canyon, or you could click on the starting line and you got the 180, you know, trackable view, full, full screen, and uh, you're like scooting down the, the track. Now those are 360 videos that, uh, 360 and 180 videos that you couldn't even put on your face. But they're, ta they're, they're like actually really immersive and awesome, but they're, they only work full screen because if you put a shaky you know, head cam on a, three, on a cardboard, it's just not gonna be a good experience. So there's a, there's a place for almost everything. You know? And so I think uh, like building that user experience and finding how to deliver the content is just as important as how cool the content is. Yeah. So back to RI a little bit, 76% of US leisure travels participate in cultural or, or heritage activities. Um, when people are on vacation, they spend more money. So when they do go to museums, they may not even realize they're going to museums. As I said, I was in Cape May, it's like Cape May Museum. Um, there's basically um, you know, a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, I mean we're, we're in a little capitalist society, so you know, they're, they're spending for these features and it has to be economically feasible for the Museum and Science Center to do that. We'll talk about that at, at the end. Um, so really, we, we, I think we hit on this a lot. Families and schools expect well-made interactive experiences now. Um, they're not gonna go for, as I said, 360 videos. They're not gonna go for anything that makes them ill. Um, there, there was another pr company I saw, and they said it's ending next week, where they have an immersive experience. And the reason why it's ending is people are getting nauseous on a device. So it wasn't, you know, I don't want to say it wasn't well made, but they, you know, it can be well made. I think they have the employees like uh, with the people. And, and you know, to, to, I know from owner of VR Center, to get employees to do that is, you know, we all seen well, like when people playing like race car games and they're moving to race car and like haptic, um, that doesn't would not work well. It has to be, you know, Finn might want to talk about a little bit of AI involved on there, just making it a very well experienced, good programmers, people really, um, you know more of the techno aspect. Yeah, I think, you know, very with, well with made. Uh, iteration costs money. Plain and simply, you make something, it's not quite as good enough as you'd like it to be. If you want it to improve, it's gonna cost more money and it, there's always not enough money already. So it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude for the developer to iterate on that and not say, well, this is what they asked for. It's like, yeah, but how often does a client know really what they want? They just think they know what they want, you know? And so it's, it's up to the designer to take that and bite the bullet and learn from the mistakes. And so you can do that for, right the first time, the next time. Um, one of the biggest things that we've found with like centers, uh, uh, um, museums and things like this is most places have a gift shop. Most places sell some type of other form of revenue where they can sell something. So what we'll build are these interactive experiences that go with the theme of their space, but also allow you to collect a currency that you can then go and cash in in, this, in the, in the, in the uh, gift shop. Um, and then that's a clever way of also when you're trying to get museums on board and how, how you know, and, and you, can, you can give them statistics, but all they know is that they make their most money from people coming in the museum and spending money on flashcards or books. And so what we try to focus on is, okay, we'll make you this experience and it can work with the flashcards and the books and you can collect things when you're there on site that give you actual discounts. And, you know, I mean, they're willing to just give away a coupon for 20% off anything in the store anyway, just to get you in the store. So if you offer them some type of functionality that unlocks to a 20% discount, they're more than happy to, that, to sell that to a customer because it means that you've driven, uh, look, you know, basically location-based couponing. And so that's, that's an interesting thing, which we've done some location-based couponing as well. And that's a, it's a downward rabbit hole of how deep you wanna go. But when you have 
a tangible place, a, a counter where these things are purchased, where these t-shirts and these things are purchased, you can make those uh, AR image targets and have a way of tying the interactive experience of somebody over there. How many times have people that actually go into the museums go into the gift shop? They're like, no, we're not going to the gift shop, but the kid's going, no, no, I have, I have a coupon. So we just watched the time here because we wanted to talk about a project. Um, so I kind of backpedal a little bit. So we, there are a lot of additional revenue streams. I think we touched on this where um, if you, when you work with a, a company like us where we're also in LVR spaces where besides just making it for your museum, the children, um, we can bring it to schools. We can bring it, um, having them come to the LVR spaces. So I really want to talk about this last thing about a, I, I call it a museum in trouble. So um, basically, this is a museum. Um, I don't, does anybody recognize this museum? <laughs> Believe it or not, this is a museum. This is the Gettysburg Battlefield in Pennsylvania. So we recently worked a project with them where basically families were just looking at the battlefield going, wow, great, and, and not going to the museum. So there's a museum next to it, and um, Finn might be able to talk about that, sure. where they, to, they, they gamified it now, where they, they're going to have iPads and um, <laughs> Whoa! I'm kind of fast forward. Right out of reality. <laughs> um, so yeah. So sorry so, about that. Our time's running. You know, out. their their goal was to that they have they have so many people. The the numbers of people on the battlefield versus that drive through the battlefield versus people that actually go inside the museum and will go in. And then of those people, how many go into the gift shop and buy something? Is it was a crazy offset number. A lot of people want to go there, but you know, once they're there it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, which is a lot of museums are kind of, it's in this destination where this thing happened. And so we've been focusing on creating a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a huge experience. It's like four gigs um, of a lot of- 20 geo points, right? Really, yeah, there's 21 different geolocation points. Uh, we have uh, beacons all over the inside you of the museum. The battlefield come you alive. walk around and unlock these different uh, av uh, artifacts. There's, there are AR avatars, generals that ride up on their horses and talk to you. Uh, you unlock different artifacts that come with different 360 videos and interactive Gettysburg address thing. You get some Lincoln talking, you know, and, and really dig into everything that went on with the, the battle. And this is, a, this is an important battle that caused, uh, you know, the nation we live in was a resultant of a lot of things that happened with this battle. And there were, there were mistakes made that caused the outcome of the battle that a lot of people don't know the cause and effect of how this, this, this battle was fought, but it's by far the most iconic battle because both sides were really stupid on how they approached it. They both just marched all their people in and killed everybody from both sides. So it was like, well, we had a little bit more yeah. left on the north, and so it was, you know, and the south really so messed so up. You, so you can see on how, um, you know, a family, I'm going back there, <laughs> a family it's is a not, not going to not buy the iPad <laughs> for their children. Because their choice is to show them this or this, you know, and they basically they walk into the battlefield, um, the beacons are picking up, and then when they go to the museum, I believe the Yeah, you can, you can you actually have to check the out the devices, the you know, and and have devices to walk around the museum, have devices to take out on the battlefield, and uh, you know they bring tour buses through, and so they can fill out everybody with the tour bus, and everybody's interacting. They're not just driving past an open field saying, this is Pickett's Charge. You can actually look out and see a bunch of soldiers running. You can see 350 cannons firing, and it's a pretty cool, just an awesome sight. Yeah, and there's also, you could do seasonal things. I know Finn worked on something with, down in Austin for oh, yeah. Christmas where um, they basically they, they had kids making toys and then at the end they end up getting that toy through an AR experience. Yeah, we gave what I mean by that is a way for the museum to send out to their list of seasonal things like oh we have this Halloween experience we have. Go ahead. Do you have the video about the thing? Of the, of the, of the Christmas one? Gettysburg. It's, it's, uh, it's, so it's NDAs actually involved? launching this, this, <laughs> this it's, it's launching this month yeah. so um, so I didn't know the stipulations on sharing their content, but yeah, uh, today we land, land. they've been a great client. So, you know, um, so look for it on the iStore. But, but, you know, they've had a great experience. And then, you know, if you're emailing them saying, hey, we have a Christmas um, experience, we have a holiday experience, we have this type of experience. It's a great way, again, because this talks about additional revenue, bringing revenue back. It's a great way if you give them a great AR, VR experience. The children don't want to go back. The mom says, if you want to go over there for the holidays, um, they'll go. Well, we, we, have, we have several different programs. Some museums prefer to pay, pay up front for it. I mean, that's the best ROI, but we, we do placement programs, you know, revenue share. Um, you know, we're working with a client in Vegas where it's a revenue share model where they don't pay anything. And then maybe um, to answer your question. You know, we're, we're like a vendor in, inside the museum. With, with like what? And I'd gladly do that. <laughs> I mean, that's a great revenue because I know they're going to buy it. 
You know, if they don't, but a lot of them, they realize that when you get into the project that the ROI is so great that they would rather just outright get all the revenue. And that, that is something that we at Chicken Waffle, that's kind of one of our specialties is, is looking at the content in hand and saying, hey, is really what you want this? And they, typically it's, yes, that's, you can do that, that's magic, you know? And so that's, that's kind of what we do, you know what I mean? question is do you do you release your apps to like iTunes and, and Google Store and allow uh, yeah, they, uh, visitors they, to yeah, they all work um, they all plan on releasing an, a, um, yes, an app on that that's another revenue stream there's actually multiple revenue streams so we, you know um, I'm just watching the yeah. time sorry yeah. but there's a lot of revenue streams that these museums and science centers and, are, and are these are. the kind of things where I go to a, a museum and I just check out hardware to use I don't have to pay for they prefer like that model. yes also something to Better note experience. is that some museums have permanent installations that they want this these kind of experiences to promote like the Gettysburg museums versus some museums uh, thrive off of traveling exhibits to come into their show so really what you're doing is you're building an experience like, around the exhibit that will then end up moving to a different like, and, and another so uh, example is we have um, in the playground, you know, with baby hands, we, we have an app for that on your phone, but it's not as good as an app when you used a VR headset. So, you know, it's different potential. You could design into that. Like if you rent it from us, you're going to get, you know, more Bluetooth, you know, more, more. But if you want to do a basic experience and buy it for $10.99, that's really up to the museum. You might want to have it where it doesn't work nearby the museum. That's kind of up to the client. Every project is a unique snowflake. Again, um, when we work with clients, you know, we sit down, we figure out the ROI, we work with them. I mean, there's so many different options on it through leasing, through paying for it up front, through placement. Um, you know, because some museums don't have very small budgets. Yeah, and, and it's important if, you know, if their main goal is driving traffic into the, into the gift shop. Well, that, that changes the, stroke, the scope dramatically depending on how they want to do that. What are you trying to sell? And so those kind of things are, are important, and my, my goal is usually to identify those things with the client because typically they, they want an experience that does this, and it's about the feature, but really their goal is to do this, so it takes a bit of like, okay, well then, what if we did that feature but then had this outcome and we measured this analytic, and they go, that would actually allow me to tell my boss that this is why we're doing it, you know? And one of the great things is we've never run into, um, I mean, we work with a lot of autism groups too in education. They, everybody loves VR and AR. I mean, um, we, I mean, the smiles on the kids' faces, uh, they just want to do it over and over and over again. So that makes mom happy, you yes, know? Sir. You talk about the placement model? Yeah. But we how much how much would you put as part of your it, it, we would analyze their um, the population that they get and then we would analyze what the increase we would be able to get. I mean I I can give you a live example in our Vegas location, it's a fifty percent revenue share where they pay for the employees electric and we make the experience and we bring the hardware. And you know, and and also really, you know you know it's on an individual basis. You have depending to look on the, the project, right? Like like <laughs> I was saying, if if some, if one is way more focused on selling content out of their gift shop, yeah. then that's going to change the scope in one way or the other. Or if the other one's one is more about uh, location, like getting them to these you know spread out around the museum and make sure they get that backside, it's always different. So a bit of a bit of the process you can expect is identifying the goal and then you know, scoping the grand project and then, you know, expecting at least 10% up front so that your development pre-production can go ahead and kick off fast. You don't want that trickling in. You know, a lot of people say, well, just wait until we're sure that's what we want. It's best to go ahead and invest what you think you're gonna invest, get that, pull that trigger on the developer that you're gonna activate because you can get your vertical slice and then bring that up the flagpole to everybody that's involved in curation and give them all the give the thumbs up. And so it takes a little bit of money to make money. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank um, you. I hope we did a good talk. <laughs> all right. If you have any questions, you can ask me in the back. Um, or at the chicken the, waffle booth. Or at the chicken waffle, you can go to AWE Play.